Hey everyone, welcome to another video. And in this video, I have a few folks from Arizona State University from Business Analytics. I have Heath, Tanvi, and Kratika. Um, Heath, why don't you introduce yourself, what you're doing right now, and um, we can move on. Yeah, uh, my name is Heath. I am from Mumbai, India. I just did my master's in business analytics at ASU uh, 2021, 2022 batch and a nine month program. And currently I'm working at AppVee Pharmaceuticals in Chicago. Awesome, Tanvi. Okay, I'll quickly go ahead and introduce myself. So I graduated with the same class as Heath and Kratika with a master's in business analytics in summer of 2022. I currently work for JP Morgan Chase in the risk analytics team at the Arizona location. Prior to business analytics, I had a similar banking and finance experience and I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, hi, uh, my name is Kratika. So same batch, same class of 2022. Uh, I've, uh, I'm currently working as an associate slash business analyst at Axtria in New Jersey. Uh, prior to this, I've also done my uh, undergrad in business administration from NMMS Mumbai. So I come from a unique background of three year undergrad degree, which we can explore more about later. Yeah, awesome. Then we was your also a three years undergrad degree? Yes, but I also had another master's from India. So this was like the second master's I went through. Okay, that would have made easy with the whole like three years master's program. Um, yes. Let's talk about you guys' experience, right? Like, Heath, you had some experience before coming to the US? Oh, yeah. I worked for two years at TCS in Mumbai itself. Uh, so the experience out there and the experience out here working is pretty, it's totally opposite. Like, you can't uh, compare that and it's like comparing apples and oranges. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, would you say great pay wise, great work culture wise? You have to work six days a week. Uh, I think pay wouldn't be an issue because I think everyone would be paid the same in India. Like it was peanuts compared to here. But yeah, the work culture is is totally to a different level where they could be, it could be toxic as hell, and now it's pretty great out here. It's like you're on your own and you do do your work. No one cares about what you do with other. Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. Can we? Yes. So I had, like I tell people, I had like a decade, almost years of experience before I got here. So I can definitely feel the culture difference. I almost worked for eight long years in India before I started. I moved here and then I started working. The biggest difference, like Heath already covered, is the culture part. Like very less micromanagement. Nobody is going to judge you for what you have on your paper. It's more going to be your skill set. So your skill sets are actually going to be covered here. And one major skill set that I see as a difference is they value soft skills here. So you need not be the highest scoring student, but if you have the right skill set to match it up, that's something a big difference is. The only thing I miss about Indian working culture or is different is you don't develop the kind of relationships because the overall American culture is where you respect privacy, you have your own boundaries. So the yeah. friends and relationships that you build in India is the only thing I miss. But in terms of timings, in terms of managerial skills or having the right leadership around you, I think you will always find it more positive in the United States. 100%. Yeah. Prateka? So like I didn't have any work experience as such in the corporate industry as everyone did already. So I don't know, I, I can't say comparatively, but I would say for me as a first time experience uh, here in the States, it's pretty good. Uh, you It lets you draw that thin line between your work and uh, proper like have the work life balance because after five, no one cares what you do. No one is expecting you to work post, past that clock. So I think it's pretty good here, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think you guys also come from like different backgrounds, right? Like no work experience, a few years, and then a massive uh, work experience background. And you can see like the culture change and the culture shift. Um, maybe we can start with Kratika on this question. Kratika, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Do you work from home or do you work from the office? So I work in a hybrid setup. Uh, I have to go like office just once a day, which is Thursdays. Uh, but week, there's yeah. no yeah once a week sorry <laughs> there's no compulsion as such uh 
but like uh, everyone is promoting you to come to office these days uh on a day to day basis since i work uh, in a pharma industry it's a consulting company uh we uh, work in a onshore offshore setup so my uh, day usually starts at 7:30 with the daily hurdle meetings so um, as i'm working in the consulting team uh, a lot of my day is uh, uh, rotates around uh, scheduling meetings coordinating with different multiple teams and getting things done mm-hmm. so that's my average day like you know starts early 7:30 uh, until 10 we are busy with uh, meetings and after that you have the day to yourself and like after like 3:30 4 there's no work because we start early yeah makes sense makes sense and when when do you when you do go to the office how does it feel meeting everyone um is is just your team in the office or is all the teams in the office so uh, what they have done is like they have made uh, it compulsory for the leaders to come to the office they have an ask associate associates uh, but uh, eventually the leaders ask their teams to come to the office so everyone is coming and showing up to the office uh, and it's uh, pretty good because, because like you get to meet people at least uh, in a week so and there's some sort of interaction otherwise uh, without that on the screens you don't feel the same and then we got team lunches and everything so it's sort of great i would yeah. say at least uh, i only prefer once a week though not like <laughs> uh, two three days in a week like other yeah. people it it saves a lot of time yeah yeah for sure then we has your experience with chase and being on the mill avenue do you have to go to the office every day yes we are on a mandatory schedule of three days in person and chase is very particular about that mode of operation because we have fixed days like i cannot get up in the morning and pick my days so the entire but every line of business or every teams have their own specific days so i go through office tuesdays to thursdays so every week feels like a mini weekend for me because i get monday to friday work from home and stuff like that yeah so tuesday to thursday we operate in person the entire leadership all the teams from my line of business will be operational in the same time the model is built such that it's easy to cooperate and collaborate and then on the work from home days you can work for yourselves in your time zones which i think is very convenient the only drawback i feel is at least there should be like one day of more flexibility because you're you're getting used to remote culture and yeah. sometimes you like it to you know kind of skip a day and work from home but the model has its own wins and uh, pros and cons kind of thing for my role specifically since the role is a little more leadership and demanding there is no particular bau or set bau activities as more of ad hoc more of monthly activities more of monitoring i work very closely with the india team so chais overall operational model is also that they have a huge data and tech and all that team sitting back in india so like ratika i also start early in the morning typically 7 or 7:30 sometimes even 6 am on fridays because we push off early on friday so we start early not that we push off early without starting early yeah. so th- that's how a typical day goes and my role is different so we do have cadences of weekly meetings with our bosses fortnightly meetings with our teams team meetings within the week but there is no set day like i will only know yesterday how my tomorrow is going to look it's as correct. simple as that correct makes sense mm-hmm. that's awesome though you can do like tuesdays to thursdays like not have to go to office on monday when it's yes. the worst and not have to go to the office on friday when you can on like friday. get out a little bit yeah that's yeah. you know that's pretty awesome that they let you allow that you know they allow you um so i think that works like if i could do that i would do that for sure yeah but that again like our our managing director is nice enough or he likes this model he prefers maybe working from, or allowing people to work from home monday there are businesses who come in on monday mornings or there oh. are businesses who eat out of friday morning so it's very specific to the team but the larger organizations it's not like every small team can pick yeah see i am not a finance so auto finance most of us operate this way nice so next time mm-hmm. for a car loan i got to reach out to you no i i am on the last <laughs> you get an employee discount or no no if you default the car loan then you come to me okay so never mind i never want to that leg of the transaction yeah uh-huh. i never want to come to you then um yes, i hope so yeah keith what does your day to day look like you're in chicago windy city probably brutal right now right 
Uh, I'm pr- right now in Cincinnati on my cousins. So, oh, okay. Uh, so as you can see, it's very flexible for me. Abhi promotes three days in office, but you could choose your own days. It's very flexible. And even if I don't go for three days, I do one day or two days. No one asks me why don't I, I, I do not come into office or something like that. And that also depends on my manager as well. He's very flexible. So uh, it's like we have a monthly one-on-one meet where he encourages that we meet in person. So we try to make a schedule in such a way that, okay, I'm in office when he's there and we could uh, schedule that meeting. So it's very flexible, but we encourage us three days in office. So Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I could choose one day, Tuesday or whichever which day I want to go in. And what does your day look like? So you yep. start at 7, we start, 10, 8? We start around 9 till 5. So uh, we have two daily working sessions. Like I'm working on two different brands. Uh, two different brands as in two different medicines uh, where there are two different uh, st- uh, stand-ups and working session together. So two meetings and along with that, since I'm into tech, like into data science and data engineering, uh, it solely depends on my work. When I need to do my work, I do it. That's so awesome. it looks like a nine to five job. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, flexibility. Very That's flexible. like where, where it, wherever you can be, you know, yeah. Cincinnati and fully travel more that yeah. that definitely helps um now it's been almost a year right nine months since you have graduated um mm-hmm. and i'm assuming you guys started like your job pretty quick so eight months seven months in the u.s workforce do you feel coming to the u.s going through the university taking all that debt and you know taking all that stress was worth it or not we can start with heath and like go around I think we our batch was very lucky enough to get into a time where we just got into ASU, did a nine-month course and hit the job market as soon as possible. I think everyone got a job from our batch. Yeah. Right now, I could see that people are struggling to uh, get a job. People are keep on texting on LinkedIn, reaching out. So I think it was a really good decision, but it also, also depended on luck as well. Like we as a batch did graduate early and did get into the job market when it was really hot. And yeah, a nine month program helped for me because I was uh, happy with the uh, course curriculum of of having just nine month course being rigorous and getting into the job market. Yeah. Awesome. Tanvi, your experience is different, right? Like I remember you us talking before when we did meet at ASU that your husband came to the US beforehand. What made you guys, you know, take the leap of faith that hey, let's go to the US, let's shake up things? Because eight years of experience, like you are engraved in the work culture in Absolutely. India. You have friends, family. That's a big step to take. For us, like for even me, right? I took a gap year, didn't even work that year, and moved on. Uh for it was similar, Heath, two years, not that long of a time. For you, it seems like a massive time. What made you change that mind? And how do you feel now that you guys have been here for a while and your husband's been here for a while? Sh- share that experience with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take good five minutes to talk about it. Because yeah, today, course, honestly, and I think this month has been emotional because when we look back on how we spent the last three and a half years trying to build what we have today, like you said, it was a very difficult decision for me to like uproot everything I built for eight years. And believe me, I just had got a promotion and I resigned my job to leave it for a wedding or a marriage of my husband to be. Oh, wow. So, but we knew, we knew things were not going to look as good as they were at that point in time. We would have a break. We would have a mental, emotional, financial stress period, which was the first year. COVID made it worse. I got here in 2019 end and I was very focused on going to school in fall 2020, but God had different plans. The economy had different plans and my visa didn't come through. So I was supposed to join fall 2020. I deferred, I had to defer. So that put me through an 18 month gap period. And uh, you can, you might know, since you know so much of immigrant visa that I came on an F2 visa, which is like the yeah. worst visa to be done. And yeah, that F2 visa literally does not even allow you to go to school. It does not allow you to take a full-time course. So it was very frustrating. I tried to do everything with ASU to, you know, try to enroll a course, but it didn't work out. I deferred the admit. At that point, 
it looked like the worst decision to make. But today, I think that was the best decision to make. Because like he said, we were a class that was lucky for a good job market. Yep. Things worked out. I am a person who always wanted to study in person. So had I studied during COVID, I would have never experienced what I learned in ASU, going to school or being on ISA platforms or different things like that. So that worked out for me. We always knew there's going to be a gap and I wanted to utilize it. So what I did is, though I deferred my admit, I started prepping. When I say prepping, I'll be honest, I did not study 100%, but I started networking. I started getting to know people in Tempe, in ASU. And I think all the three of you know my journey is here that it has all fallen back and come back to me. I have a very strong network in ASU today. And so I, I planned it that way. Coming out of that, I always knew my experience is going to help me in the job market. But at the same time, it is a very different struggle to not justify your eight years and still act as a fresher and say, hey, I need a job because you don't want to apply an entry level job. But at the same time, nobody is going to directly make. I was lucky enough that I could get a position like that. But there could have been a chance where I could have had to start an entry level job or I could have had to, you know, take whatever comes my way. 100%. and stuff like that so i think the ideology is to prepare yourself for whatever is going to come like the students this year was not expecting a bad job market but now they yeah. have to be with that correct so and i was very clear of going to asu because i didn't want to live away from where my husband was i didn't want to spend two rents i didn't want to increase our overheads so that's the financial planning we had so no matter what maybe I would have gotten a better school or the best school possible. I still know financially this was my exposure. Second right. thing, I knew my experience, all I needed was to get a master's degree and an OPT track to be practical and get a job. So the nine months course was the best fit. I had admits for a 12 month course or 15 months course, but for me, it was very clear. The shorter the course, the faster I'm going to get a job. So that's what BA, you know, helped me with. Why I would have picked this particular course, maybe I'll talk more about it eventually, but this was a good blend in what I had and I want, what I would have wanted to do because US is all about technology and I had to fill that technical expertise gap on my resume. So I think it's, it's all about planning. If you're uprooting something that you've built in India and coming to US, you yeah. have to be ready. With, this is how my plan is going to look. If this doesn't look like, I think Heath and Kratika would know. I almost thought I wouldn't get a job. So I took an MBA admission in ASU really? and I'm like, okay, continue studying. <laughs> if worst case, I don't get a job, I can do a part-time job in ASU and I can continue studying. So right. always be ready with what may not have. Even when students, like he said, students ping us now that, hey, we're not getting a job. I'm like, take an ASU job. It's not going to hurt. It's, right. it's okay to work for a nonprofit and start your journeys like that. Yeah. So, 100%. I would say, yeah, my, my concluding answer would be like, be ready for what you're going to do in this country or focus on your end goal. My end goal was to land a good job. And I spent three years building myself for that. So it's absolutely okay when I look back today. Yeah. But I think that decision, first of all, you cannot time it, right? You guys came in 2021. Yeah. COVID was right. still going on. It was still risky. People were having difficulties getting visas. You guys took the leap of faith and made it. People thought that 2022 graduates would be great. And things have gone to basically shit, yeah. right? Like the market has turned over. 2023 is going to be the same way. So it's really difficult to time it. People who graduated yeah. in 2020, right? They became that part of like, oh, COVID has hit we are in a very bad spot but if they could have waited like or if they could have extended their program six more months suddenly january 2021 the, the market picked up and they're hiring like crazy like you could get to the top companies in no possible time right uh right. so looking back it all makes sense but taking that leap of faith is very yeah, difficult yeah. especially you know when you're when finance, like finance, I think money is the biggest problem. Absolutely. Right? Like if you're not financially strong or if you're taking a risk, like me and Kratika, we both, I finished my loan last year, but Kratika is still on her loan. So that, like that risk, and it's like a ticking time bomb while you're going through college. Uh, Correct. 
So, but I feel like you need to prepare yourself for the best case scenario and the worst case scenario and, worst and case. face those fears way in advance, like see what I need to be doing and how I need to be preparing in case the market goes down. And like, so you need to prepare from day one. I need to network more. I need to put myself in different situations so that I can, you know, get to know more people, get into more places, potentially get more interviews. Um, right. If you just are dependent on the market, it might not be in your favor or every time. Um, Kratika, what was your experience like? Uh, you know, I, I know COVID happened right after you were graduating. Tell us about that. So uh, for me, I would say uh, going through all that stress of two years during the COVID period uh, when I was applying and then eventually I had to defer the inmates. Uh, at that time, I was thinking, why is it uh, not working out for me? Uh, why things are working out this way, the way it is right now. But then when I look back now, uh, I'm fortunate that things didn't work out. It was the best for me because I would have gone for a online course and then graduated and uh, would have graduated in uh, not the best times. Uh, and as I look back, I graduated in uh, actually a hot market. So there were tons of jobs available and I didn't have to go through the hassle of, you know, having that stress, oh, there are not e enough opportunities I can apply for. So I think uh, timing wise, uh, whatever worked was the best for me. Uh, uh, but, and also like, if I look back, uh, I would say going through that uh, hassle of applying through the universities, researching a lot because I come from a three-year undergrad uh, business background and uh, all the universities here require a four-year undergrad degree. So to compensate for that, you I had to go through another one-year PhD uh, post-graduation certification program. Uh, so that was a lot of complexities involved and took a lot of time and research. So it was a lot of hassle, but uh, it was completely worth it because uh, that only took two years of time from my life, but now it will be like worth of six years or 10 years. I don't know for how long I'm here, uh, will be, I, I'll be here for, but I think it's gonna be uh, definitely worth it. It was just two years, but uh, looking at the bigger picture, it's gonna work out pretty well, yeah. Okay, my next question for you guys is, how is the experience at ASU? ASU being such a famous university for analytics. I know, you know, their MBA school is also pretty famous. A uh, lot of students from Phoenix, from California, uh, from the Southwest area come to ASU. ASU is like one of the biggest universities among these states. How was your experience there? On a day-to-day -day basis, was, were your expectations met? Like, were your expectations met as in were the courses up to you know up to what you were hoping for? Um, were there any problems or hiccups? And I want to see how what you learned in your nine months course because nine months is a very short period of time. Like in your nine or ten months course, did it prepare you very well for the industry you are in and for the corporate job you got into? So we can start with Heath and then move. So I think uh, the course, uh, how someone felt about the course would depend on person to person because uh, it also depended on the experience because I had a tech experience and uh, working for two years back in India, I really felt that, okay, this nine month course, I just need to uh, just upscale my skills or whatever I know so that uh, I just get in a job market. So for me, yeah. those course wasn't that a priority than a job market. So getting into the job market after that nine months was a priority for me. So the course was smooth. Uh, some professors were new as well. So they were also learning of how do you uh, interact with students and all those things. But for me, it was really smooth and I did not have any ups and downs. It was just a smooth transition getting into US. It was like an entry for the job market in the US for me, the course mm. uh, at ASU. So it was really smooth for me and um, no hiccups. Nice. Okay. Tanvi, I know you've been involved with ISA a lot. Like you had your plate full with academics and extracurriculars. Like what, how was your experience? My experience was like a 
what do you call it, a full packed show for nine months because I tried to do a lot in the least time available. But talking of academics first, nine months is never going to upscale you with every detail or every skill that they try to squeeze in. Like imagine a simple comparison, you undergrads uh, and engineering graduates or other grads take 32 credits in two years and we take it in nine months. So that's like a clear thing that we are not going to learn the in-depth knowledge that a two year program teaches. Okay. So what they're just going to do is introduce you to something, go learn it on yourself after the nine months. So if you have that clear expectation or idea set in your head, it's okay. Because I know some students come with an expectation. Oh, they didn't teach everything. They were never going to teach you everything in nine months. <laughs> that's why they gave you prerequisites. So that's why they yeah. prepared you with what is required before you enter. So if you come with that level of expectations, you're always going to be disappointed. And let's be fair, most of the people pick nine months because you want to make it quick. And then you even learn quick or even they teach you quick. So right. that bit is get off. If you want to squeeze in a like other things to do, you'll have to kind of balance it out. Like I would use my free time for ISA instead of doing the, but I, I think we, I pretty much balanced it. I had fun with friends. I did the party school levels. I did the extracurricular. So and a lot of it helped because like I said, I was preparing for this course a year before a normal student right. started preparing. So I factored all that in. Like I knew who to contact in AIC. I knew who to speak to in ESU or I knew friends. I already had 10 friends built before I walked through the door. So that all helped to kind of balance it out. And yeah. nine months is only going to tell you what business analytics is, how you prepare it, how you introduce your, like how you put yourself out in the job market, how you prepare yourself for the interviews is all you. So right. the earlier to prepare. So if there's any student who wants to prepare for a nine months course, I would say just start, stop thinking or contemplating how the nine months are going to look, just start doing what you can to make the most out of that. Plus, business analytics has so many courses like Heath and Kratika would pick data science, I would pick just pure analytics to apply in the banking. So you're never going to like all the coursework or you're never going to fit in the, all the coursework. Pick your best fits out of the 10 courses. I knew only four of my forte. Focus on those, learn those, and then leave the six to learn on the job. Awesome. That's, that's the best way you can do it. And Kritika, for you? I think uh, given my circumstances and the best options I had, this was the best possible option for me uh, because I researched a lot and uh, this was the most feasible option for me. Also, I made sure uh, since I came from a non-tech background, I made sure even before going into the course uh, that I have to find the right set of people to get make through the course because uh, eventually there are so many courses like uh, classes you take during your program that are uh, very tech focused and uh, you you never have those skills uh, because i don't come from a tech background so you need to have those people who are well uh, well um, equipped with uh, those skills and the, the, the people who can help you through uh, you know those uh, assignments and as we were always slogging away uh, you know to meet the deadlines and uh, i think during this nine month uh, the best part was like the caption project I think for me, as I come from a uh, not a, uh, I I don't had the uh, that uh, work experience. I think the caption project really helped me because uh, it gave an insight about how real life projects work like, and we had the opportunities uh, to work on life projects during. Uh, it was a three four month stretch uh, caption project. Yeah, so I think it really helped me, uh, and yeah, it was good. That's but awesome. at the same time, there are people who don't research enough and just go for uh, what others are doing. So I would say choose the options that are best for you and don't rely on anyone else's decision. And uh, do what, because uh, people are, there are so many people who are smarter, but they eventually end up in the wrong place because by just following the footsteps of others. So I would say just research on yourself, by yourself and uh, take the option that's best for you and not just following uh, other people's decision. 100%. I think a couple of things, right, for the new people who will be coming in, academics and corporate, like their pace can never match. What are you going to learn in academics? 
is never going to be happening in the corporate world. The corporate's like 10 steps ahead every time. Maybe the BA program being so new, it is still way aligned with corporate than other programs. Like I've seen, regardless whether it's computer science, maybe computer science also is like really aligned with the corp, uh, corporate because they're kind of ahead because they're researching on new topics. But like the the technical fields, the core courses like mechanical, all of, uh, mechanical, electrical, construction, these courses will always be five steps behind the corporate because corporate has that money for doing the R&D. Uh, so you need to make sure that, you know, you are filling up that five step gap by doing your homework while you're still going through the course. And uh, I actually met a couple of people from UT Austin doing business analytics there this past weekend. And one of them had a great experience and one of them had like really exhausting experience in those nine, 10 months. And it all came down to, hey, how do you, first of all, your group of friends matters a lot. Second, how much help you can ask and how much help you can give matters a lot. Uh, and the third thing is like more research you do, like th there's a saying, the more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in the war. Um, you know, that's exactly what what happens when you come to the university. The more research you'll do, the better off you are, the more you know, courses you take, like online courses to prepare yourself for the masters, everything's going to help. So make sure whoever's watching, you know, you guys go through that. Um, maybe you guys all together, maybe, you know, Kratika, can you, what was your fees structure for the whole year? How much fees did you guys pay for the MSBA so, course? Maybe someone else can take this off. <laughs> yeah. I think... Uh... Do you just the course or like just the, the entire... course? No, just the course itself. Like, of course, we know living expenses in Phoenix it's going up, but that's so variable. So, just the course. I think it was fifty five thousand dollars. Fifty six yeah. by the end of the semester, we they bumped up a little bit. Yeah, so it yeah. was twenty eight each semester. And okay, I got a scholarship of five thousand, three to five thousand dollars. I'm not sure, but yeah. Okay. So, and I think it was uh, divided into four quarters. So four installments to pay. And I think the additional was health insurance and everything was covered into that as well. Yeah. Health insurance, gym fees and recreational fees and all those things. And would you guys say that your living was always under, under $1,500 per month? I think for me, yeah. yeah, because I was sharing my room. So we were four people in a 2B2, but the we're talking about Nexa. I was also staying at Nexa. So yeah. It was expensive as that, but um, I think having great roommates also help in reducing those costs as well, because if you make food together, that reduces your expenses. Um, and the other things would depend on person to person. If I like to go out, I like to go party and also there you have your expenses as well. So I, I try to keep, keep, keep it under 1500, but I'm not sure if I did. Right. Yeah, but let's say a student's coming in, he's cooking at home, he or she's cooking at home, and they're, you know, let's say sharing an apartment, or I know Krat I know Kratika's apartment, right? Like, she mm -hmm. was living in a separate room, but um, it was still, how much was your rent, Kratika? $650. Yeah. $650, so still would but come under. Into, yeah. Yeah, would still I come think... under. You could keep it under twelve hundred if you are living into a budget way, yeah, yeah. like keeping and managing a budget. You're just sticking to your masters and living your life a normal way. So I think you could keep it under twelve hundred in Phoenix. I'm not. I, I think, think... Uh, it's quite manageable because, like, even though I was going out, like for the rent I was paying, I yeah. think uh, the other expenses could be balanced under twelve hundred easily. Yeah. Right. That's good. That's good to know. Um, but just but, to add one more yes, point, please. sorry to add. No, no, yes. So the fee structure for us was 56, but if you're aware, ASU added another semester to the mm -hmm. BA program, and if students opt for that, it's a $30,000 addition. What do you mean another semester? You Instead of finishing so now, in two semesters, yeah, you can finish in three? 
P semesters, yeah. But it's an entire specialization semester. So if you say somebody wants to specialize in, I think, blockchain or financial technology and stuff like that, there's more about it on the website or I can share the link. You can add mm -hmm. it in your description or whatever. But uh, that's another $30,000 of cost. And there are a lot of students who reach out to us asking, hey, what do you, you know, suggest about this? Like I tell them that we couldn't experience that third track, so I wouldn't want to, you know, comment a lot. But just to give a very generic comparison, I would always weigh if it's worth paying $30,000 or just starting a job offhand. Because you it's can add another online you, MBA or something. Yeah, it always makes to go for a job. Like 30000 you Correct. can, you know, that's like one, um, you know, what do you call um it's like your three month salary or let's say four month salary, right? Um, maybe five months, depending on whatever your salaries are. But let's say you're starting off at 90K, that is your four month salary. Uh, Correct. And I have a friend who's doing MBA and, you know, who's doing like part time MBA at ASU okay. and he's working as well. And he's making his salary, but like he pays off, I think, 14, no. I, 18k a semester or something like that for his mba definitely expensive but according to him it's worth it especially since he's working and doing this part-time it all like comes down to okay how is it going to help me in my current job and like later on so it makes sense for him but i think one reason why this ba program has been so famous overall is because of you Nine come months. in quick get out quick start making money it is challenging for people like Kratika who just started in their industry, who started in this industry just now without any experience. But for you, Heath and like Tanvi. So overall, would you guys say like experience counted when you were going for your uh, career fair? It did. Heath? It did. For me, it definitely did. Yeah. I mean, I never had a career fair, to be honest. I think yes, you never had a career fair like that. But, but yeah. it's okay when you were looking for jobs as well, right? Yeah, it definitely did. Like, whenever they ask about the two year experience, they asked what you did in that, and just the skills, and they were they they good they did get impressed with that. So the two years mattered a lot. Yeah, uh, and then for Kratika, you had no experience, or you had like a little bit of experience. What did you guys talk about when you do went to the companies and like interviewed with them? So uh, I didn't have the experience, but like uh, uh, ASU provided us a lot of projects we could work on. First was a capstone project, and we also did the uh, Six Sigma project. So those two projects were really helped me to talk about something, to talk something about uh, during my interviews. And because like you just can't uh, say I came out of a master's program, you need to talk about real life uh, projects. So I think uh, that was the selling point for me. There's an option for three semesters now at ASU. You can extend it, but you'll have to pay 30000 Kratika, you had to say something about that third semester. Yeah, I was saying like, um, if you go for that third semester, you will also graduate around December, which is not the best time because most of the companies hire during the, sorry, yeah, during spring and um, December, the job opportunities are not as much in the market and uh, I've heard from people who have done masters before who graduated in December, they said like, we had um, struggled uh, because holiday we season. didn't have as many options. Right. Also it's holiday season, so people yeah. are right. For anyone who doesn't know, US is closed last three weeks of December, or at least two weeks, I would say. Two weeks of December and first week of January, not barely anything happens that's the least productive time of the year uh even then like there would be some people who would be working in the last week of december as well but more or less likely those last three weeks are so chill you could be working and not working at the same time it's it's that kind of situation it's great for us because like I am at work and I'm not wasting any of my PTOs, but like the workload is so less that it almost feels like holiday season. Well, it is for some people. Uh, what was the diversity like in your class? Were you guys all in like the same, you were in same class, but they had to d divide you up in batches, correct? So mm -hmm. tell cohorts. us, tell, yeah, cohorts, tell me about that. Heath, you want to talk about it? 
Yeah, I think four cohorts, uh, we were around 180, uh, 45. Now it's 260, what I've heard. Yeah, so they increased the number of students who could get in. But if students are coming in for diversity or you know having different culture, they are coming for, for the wrong thing because uh, ninety percent of them are Indians. Let's be honest with that. Like in ASU, ninety percent of students in the entire university would be Indians. So I think if you are looking for that cultural diversity and looking to you know network in that sort of part of uh, life, I think ASU wouldn't be the right choice for you because all those programs everywhere, it's mainly Indians. You could do the same thing in India itself now, I feel. Yeah. So I wouldn't say entire university, only specific master's program now, like uh, ma I mean, like master's in MS in construction management, now MS in BA, and no, like no, no, a few no, no, masters. No. Yeah. And like uh, for us, like in our cohort, there was um, a lot of diversity because Asians uh, also come in a lot uh, at ASU. That's why we uh, got to see at least some diversity. Uh, unlike I don't know how it is now, and maybe then we can uh, add on to that. If, like how I didn't was. see. Yeah, we were two hundred, a little over two hundred in four cohorts. But I would say seventy-five to eighty percent because in team groups of four, three of us were Indians. I think most of us can relate. At least Heath and Kratika's cohort had little diversity. Mine did not have anything. Like I can, I can still picturize three whole rows of students, just Indian students. My first and, time was uh, entirely Indians. Like my team. Right. Was and so. just to give a little more color on the statistics, ASU currently has four thousand Indian grad students enrolled. Let's not talk of undergrads because no. that's a different, increasing ball game altogether. So, yes, unfortunately, if you're looking for diversity, that's not going to be what you see in most of the common courseworks. Yes, you might find diversity in architectural courses or environmental engineering that my husband must have taken up or a very few structural kind of courseworks, but construction, BA, even MBA is getting full with Indians. MS Finance is getting full with Indians. Let's not talk about computer science, IT and software because we have two buses of Indian students traveling every day from Tempe to Phoenix campus. So yeah, I mean, a diversity yeah. is a little skewed towards the Indian All population. mainstream courses, yeah. Yes, but there are ways you can pick and choose or no, if you know how you to deal. Think? Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Like, so please continue. No, no, I said that there are ways to pick your own, you know, diverse group, even while being with an Indian population. So. That, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was saying like, I've heard from different students, right? Like that ASU has been not been capping, like it, they've been increasing the batch sizes, not capping on admissions. Um, would you like to comment on that at all? Um, how do you guys feel about it? I think, you know, top universities, one thing which always comes to my mind is like the exclusivity, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're not capping on ambitions and they have increased from 180 to 216 within a year, that's that's a massive increase, right? Like the 80 student increase, that's that's a lot of people, or almost 100, sorry. Um, what do you guys think about it? Like how does even in construction management, I, I'm like I'm a construction management student, I know so many students from CM program, and they have the same complaint that there is no cap and they are just like in taking a lot of students. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on it? And like, how is it fair? I get it. International students pay. Is it fair for ASU to do this to the alums? Because now, like every year, it's like 2x, 4x, 8x. The diversification and the exclusivity is like getting reduced. I would, I would give a little critic comment here yeah. it's two way they are not capping admits but students are still preferring asu yeah. correct like le when ba students start reaching out to the alumni in spring semester when they get the admits they know we are already a class of 200 and they could possibly be 250 at least yeah but we are still picking it because we see the outcome 
I mean, Parth, we all know everybody in the end is here to get a job and work in the United States. Right. Let's talk specific to BA. Most of the students are picking this course, to be honest, to get land a job, to get their OPT journey started. 100%, so as yeah. much as ASU is not capping the admissions, students are not stopping either. Right. The moment students start saying, oh, I don't want to sit in a class of 260 Indians. The university is gonna maybe look at it and say, "Oh, hey, we know." And to be, I, I know I, from conversations within ASU, I know that they are also starting to realize this in diversity problem, and they're gonna try and divert. Like, I don't know if you're aware of this, but five years ago, when computer science was the hot program for ASU, yeah, that's when ASU started the program for IT and software because they mm -hmm. wanted to maintain the quality of computer science at the same time admit students. So what they would do is they would reject you from computer science, but they would ask you if you're looking to go to these diverse courses. So that's like still motivating students to give you options, but we're not going to make it here. So maybe if BA blasts out of 300 students next year, they might start to, you know, motivating students into other courses like ISM and management and technology, or they are coming up with, I believe, I wouldn't quote this anywhere, but a data analytics kind of core tech program kind of thing Got it. in the undergrad and grad level sports. So as much as ASU is not capping it, students are still expect, uh, accepting the admits. So it's, it's a give and take. This college needs students and they need their revenues and student needs colleges that land them jobs. Yeah. Arizona has got to be a hot market anyway with TSMC and stuff like that coming. So there are jobs coming out of ASU yeah. degrees. So 100%. why wouldn't students that it's easy yeah. access on the west so utd is already full so maybe as you get there and then there's another university that so i think it's 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 all going to just keep changing dynamics yeah five years ago it was definitely computer science today it's ba maybe in another five years you never know mba becomes the hot market in asu because if you have seen their marketing they're strongly advocating mba programs yeah they're strongly through students in the class of 2020, ASU gave 100% scholarships to MBA students just to, you know, have that quality level of students come through. Right. And I, I know some very good students who have accepted 100% scholarship and come to ASU against a very good B school admit, because most of it is also about money. Like I want to study, but I don't want to spend $100,000 on my MBA. 100%, so if yeah. ASU is offering me scholarship, I'm going there. And trust me, this is the school strategy or this is how it's going to look. So mm -hmm. we'll have to accept it. Uh, good that you cleared it up. I think for students who are coming in and understand for them to understand this is like very important because for a lot of students, it's a big shock when they do come to mm -hmm. ASU and they get, do come to UTD NEO and they're like, I did not expect this. And I don't know how they did not expect it or how I did not know about it already because I've been a big advocate of like, do your research, talk to people who are already there and figure things out before you move here because your course is a shorter period. Um, but thanks for sharing that. One thing I'd like to ask you guys is like, what is what would be, you know, three top skills students need to know? Like so it could be softwares, programs, soft skills. Um, what would be those top three skills students should know uh, before coming to the US if they are planning for data analytics. We can, Kratika, you want to go for it first? Uh, I would say like, uh, at least you're, if you're coming from a non-tech background, like I would say for the, them, uh, do basic of SQL, Python, so that at least you have some hang of it or rather than just coming out of nowhere. Um, otherwise, to, um, once you are in the program or uh, to land a job, I would say essentially, which is the most basic skill, but like sec uh, Excel is going to take you places and it's like used still everywhere people are using a basic Excel. Uh, so you need to ha ha get a hang of Excel first thing, then uh, SQL, uh, even though you don't use it. On your in your job on an everyday basis, it will help you because it helps you fetch data easily and within minutes. And like, um, secondly, uh, good communication and presentation skills. I think these three 
are uh, really important for you to have. Hmm. Tanvi, what would you think? I think I'm going to completely deviate from the technical skills because if you write the best codes in Python, but if you can't talk about it in the interview, you're never going to land that best Python job. So yeah. I would say even if it's a data and analytics course in the United States, you first need the best soft skills or the best communication skills to be passed. Because if you don't know how to speak to a recruiter when they call you or convince them how good you are a fit or how best you can write a Python code or an SQL code, or if you have six years of that, you're never going to land that first walk in the door, correct? That's the first and foremost thing. Second, that has helped me talk to people, like network. If you know, because, and networking does not mean with alumni or presidents in the university or just, you know, big level people in the industry. It could be just a cohort mate. It could be just a, another course mate, correct? Because you never know who can help you where in this country. And yeah. I think Parth, you can also be a judge of that because you've spent enough number of years in the country, not only as a professional, but as a personal level. And we all know that networking goes a long way in this country. And the third one, which Kratika a little bit touched upon is yeah. Excel is under Excel is <laughs> underestimated. And I have done eight years of my career in India only with Excel skills. I did not know SAS. I did not know SQL. And trust me, it's one of the largest used tool even today. You will write a code in SQL and Python. You will extract it and you will work it in it in Excel or you'll put it in a PowerPoint. So don't underestimate your office skills, Microsoft Office Suite skills. And if you have the best of them, portray it out. Tell people I know to do a lot in Excel. Correct. So I think these are the top three skills I would focus on no matter what industry or what data background I am from. Keith, I think the the ladies covered mm -hmm. it all. But what do you think? You can add uh, time management as well into that. Like, how do you allocate your time to what? Uh, like your week, how does it look like? You need to prepare it beforehand. With your like the schedule for the courses would come like one month back. We start so you know what to do when, how to spend your time, and, and uh, how do you keep on uh, just. Uh, submitting your assignments and everything like keep that in handy as well your time management skills cool. Cool. um if you guys had to tell like everybody talks about networking right like you talked so much about networking how do you initiate it just one you know don't share your tips share an instance which could teach somebody else like hey this is how i networked with this x person and just share that one instance with me because everybody says do networking, do networking, do networking. Nobody teaches you how to network. And it's it's a learning curve. It it won't come to you right after you go there. You can't just download it in like a podcast and listen to it and start networking. Share just one instance, one real life instance where you're like, oh, this was a great way I could network and I, I have that connection now. Whether it's on LinkedIn and it's in person, share that with me. I mean, uh, I think small talk it's, gets you a long way. Talk about anything you can relate to with that person you want to network with. Like I try to network on sports as of matter. Like that was a great game in baseball or uh, the uh, American football or anything like that. Let's just start with something you feel that the other person could connect on. And then we could just go on like that. And there have been instances where I have connected with a few of those people uh, through sports. So that's one thing I could say about. Yeah, I, I can share an instance, but just to give context, we make networking about ourselves. Make it about the person in the front also, because leave room for the person to talk, ask questions, because say, say I'm talking to Heath and there's, a conversation about sports that I never gave him a chance to speak about. But if I give him a chance to speak about sports, he and I have something in common and then we start from there. Instead of sports, it could be a, a, a role that I'm interested in or an industry I'm interested in. So let me give a simple example. When I was the president for ISA, I was meeting a director from ASU for lunch. She's an Indian director. And I was meeting her because she likes to meet Indian students who are at positions. Okay, and just while having a conversation, she said, I see you right over LinkedIn. And 
I have something in my career services team. And then that conversation hit and I became the management intern in the second semester. And that job came with the tuition funding. So little things, how your conversations or what you do, like I am a banking or a risk professional, but I do something on LinkedIn that somebody caught an eye on or somebody spoke about. So make it an interesting conversation. Don't make it just about, I want a job and these are the skills I have. Give a fun fact about yourself. It could be some music you play or something because then that makes the person interested in you beyond just, oh, this person has a master's and a 4.0 GPA and stuff like that. So right. make it an interesting conversation or a story about yourself. 100%. Prateka? I think they covered it all, yeah. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any instance from the career fair where you were like, oh, um, this, you know, this is what I talked about today. It worked. I'm going to use this strategy over and over. So not from the career fair, but like when I was joining a university, uh, I like, obviously you are coming to the US, so you need to uh, talk to people a lot, like get to know everyone. So then that will help you find out the best people for you because you have to filter people, right? You can't um, like everyone and anyone. So to reach out there first, you you can't just think about what you can take from the person. You also have to think how you can be useful to the other person. So first you have to make, uh, you know, use of the existing skills you have. If you have like, uh, when I was joining university, I used to do, uh, do a lot of research. So I was just giving away that research on WhatsApp groups like we made for uh, ASU MSBA program. I was just helping out people if they were asking some questions. So that way, uh, that was like a kind of an icebreaker and people uh, eventually start trusting you because give out all the information you have so that when you uh, are in need, people are ready to help you because you are not just going to go first and ask hey can you please help me on this even without helping other you can't expect from them so first right. you have to make yourself useful for the others uh, if eventually they will help you yeah awesome i think that summarizes your experience at asu your experience a bit of corporate world what skills they should be learning what students should be expecting from the asu msba program if you guys had to tell one thing just pick one thing to a student, what would it be? It could be academic wise, it could be personal life wise, it could be, you know, just like a life advice. If you had to pick one thing, what would it be? You guys can think about it. I can share mine. Like I love, love to tell students like, hey, um, you know, face the problems like early on because the more you wait, because I used to be like that, I would just like keep pushing my problems over and over and over like for weeks and weeks and then it became so big that suddenly it's like a big challenge in front of me where I could have just tackled it and it seemed smaller once I solved it uh, so don't look at problems as problems but as challenges where you're going to learn something and over the years it's going to be super useful for you um, if you guys have something like that hey I live by this and I want to share that with the students it could be as small as it could be super small, but if it works for you, it works for you. Tanvi, do you have something like that? Yeah, yeah, I can tell one thing with all the years of experience or all the experiences I gained at ASU or just overall in life, not too old enough, but old enough to say, take every experience that comes through the door. Just take it. Okay. I remember two years ago when I started Fall 21, almost one and a half year ago. And this ISA opportunity came to me. ISA was looking for fresh leadership and stuff like that. And people were like, oh, no, you can't do it. Nine months. I'm like, okay, let me try. What's the worst that will happen in life if you fail? It's okay. Like, I would have become nothing out of it, but at least try, okay? Go to places, go to events, interact. With, what, what's the thing if you go to an event? You'll get bored. Just leave. Right. What's the thing that happens if you go attend a party where you don't really fit in, but you never know you might strike a good conversation. So go through experiences that make you comfortable and uncomfortable both. 100%. Like as simple as that. And trust me, sometimes it works wonders. If if sometimes I sit and think, what if I would have said no to that ISA opportunity only because it gave me too much stress and you know, I almost slept least in those nine months. I 
I didn't know what was happening in my house. I didn't know what was happening in my husband's life. Nothing. Yeah. But today, I can confidently say it helped. It helped me that's... never. So this and in US, when you come here as a student, there's so much that's going to come to you. Try to see what best you can do with your time and like keep accepting opportunities. It could be volunteering. It could be going to church with a friend. It could be just going and attending some event. It could be just anything. Literally, just just say yes and try it once. 100%. It's okay to fail. Like absolutely okay to fail. Yeah. Yeah. Eight. What would be your uh, one tip? Like a tip to uh, students who are coming out here and would be sharing a room or an apartment, try to find good roommates because it would take you a long way. Like having good roommates personally, uh, like it solves fifty percent of your burden. Like you could chill with them. You could like in monetary terms as well. You could share your expenses. So having a good roommate takes you a long way in th that master's program. So I'll say have a good roommate and. Yeah, and have fun as well. Like, don't stick to your course and everything. Have fun. Go to uh, if you if you're going to ASU, go to Mila, Scottsdale. Have fun. That's awesome, Kratika. Uh, not like just ASU related, but like I would say, uh, try out or uh, everything uh, very early in your career so that you don't sit with the what ifs, as they said. Um, uh, like I didn't know. Um. Uh, which career I wanted to go for, like which master's program I wanted to go for. I tried so many different options very early on, like right after my undergrad, like I did a, a bachelor's in business administration. Then I tried uh, working for uh, some time for a marketing agency. Then I also uh, wanted to explore the digital marketing space that was there. And I studied that. Then I was not sure whether I wanted to go for a master's in business analytics because I was so scared to uh, go for a, tech course because I come from a non-tech background so the best option I was thought was rather than uh, risking a uh, education loan and just going for a degree right there I decided to go for a one-year uh, uh, post-graduation certification program in data science that will eventually help me in the longer run to apply for the universities and that that will also uh, give me a context about how a data science program is and like so I tried that also in India itself, so that uh, I, at least I don't have that burden and stress. Oh shit, uh, this uh, this is so hard. I can't get through this. I can't do this. So I think I tried on everything possible early in those two years, so that I am in the space I am uh, right now, and I think I'm pretty satisfied with, uh, with where I am, and I don't sit with the regrets. I would definitely have if haven't I had I done those things early on. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. Super awesome. We sorry to take your hour and fifteen minutes on a Saturday, but this is going to help so many students. And then you know, I'm planning to like do this with other MSBA students or MEM students as well from different universities. But I wanted to get your experiences, like even being in the same batch, you have such a diverse, like different and diverse experience, right? So. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining. And, uh, you know, do you guys mind if I put your LinkedIn in the description? No, no, no. Awesome. I'll do that so that students can reach out if they do need help. Uh, for the students who are watching, please do not pester. If you do not get a response after some time, it's fine. Like these guys have their jobs, personal life, you know. Like, don't worry if they don't respond. There's like hundreds of other students at, who have went to ASU's BA program who might respond to you. So just keep trying and keep trying. Well, thanks everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you yeah. for involving us. Yeah. All right. Don't, don't go yet. We got to still take a thumbnail. So. <laughs>